It's been a long time, but I'm back with a new lesson. Let's start this one out by fixing a bug in the program and adding some tool tips to make the game a little bit easier to play. I'll also talk a little bit about the future of the project at the end of the lesson. We'll start by opening up the project in Visual Studio and going to the Attack with Weapon class. Here someone noticed a bug. When we were validating the minimum damage and maximum damage, the parameters that are passed into this function, I originally had underscore minimum damage and underscore maximum damage. So I was validating against the backing variables and not the actual parameters. All we need to do in this one is get rid of the underscores on line 19 and line 24, and that fixes the bug. The next step is to do what I could have done in the first place that would have caught this bug, and that's add some unit test. Over in the test engine, I created an actions folder and a new unit test class, test attack with weapon. I've got four new test methods in here. One where we test the constructor with good parameters. We pass in a minimum damage and a maximum damage that's valid. And then the next three, if you notice, we have expected exception type of argument exception. So we're going to pass in some bad parameter values and we're expecting in this unit test that it should throw an exception. So here we, on line 24, we test creating some damage values for an item that's not a weapon. On line 35, we have test where the minimum damage is less than zero, since we don't want to allow negative one for the minimum damage. And on line 46, we have a function to test if the maximum damage is less than the minimum damage, which we don't want. And that's what this situation will do. It'll pass in two as the minimum damage, one as the maximum damage, and it should throw an argument exception. So now if I go to my solution and use my ReSharper plugin to run my unit test, I'll see that my actions all pass now, but I'll also notice that my test create game session fails. We've got a unit test here where we're expecting town square, and we actually got town square with a capital S. So let's go to this test. This is in the test game session class, and we'll change the town square so that it's capitalized correctly. And rerun our unit test and see that everything comes up green now. Now we'll make some improvements to the game, make it a little bit easier for the player. We'll go to the engine project and go into the models item quantity class. On lines 10 and 11, I've added this new expression body property, quantity item description. And this just returns a string that has the quantity and it goes to the item factory, gets the item name for the item ID, since the only other value we have in here for the item is the item ID. So this way we have a nice string that will say something like one snake skin, five granola bars, whatever, whatever the item and quantity is. We also need to on line one add the using directive so that we have access to the item factory class since it's in the namespace engine.factories. Now we can go into the quest class and here on lines 20 through 30, I've added another expression body property called tooltip contents. And what this is going to do is take a lot of the properties and make a formatted message that we can display when the user hovers their cursor over the item in the data grid. In this case, for the quest, it's going to show the description. Then it will do an environment new line, so it puts the following text on the next line down and it does two new lines here to give some extra space. Then it says items to complete the quest. We have a little bar and we do string.join with environment new line and the items to complete. So we're looking at the items to complete and we're going to select that new quantity item description. So if you need five snake skins to complete a quest, this is going to return the string five snake skins. And if you need multiple types of items to complete a quest, this string join with the environment new line will put a new line at the end of each one. So you'll see a nice kind of a shopping list of everything you need to do to complete the quest. And we'll do the same type of thing with the rewards. We'll show how many experience points you get. 
how much gold you get, and then what reward items you have. Then we'll go into the recipe class and do the same type of thing. We'll create this new tooltip contents expression body property that shows the ingredients and then a list of all the ingredients with their quantities and then what it creates and a list of all the output items with their quantities. So this way when the player hovers over a recipe on the data grid, they'll see the full details of what they need to create it and what it's going to create. Now that we have these two new tooltip contents properties, we'll go into mainwindow.xaml and in our data grid for the inventory quest and recipes, we'll go to the quest tab item, go to its data grid, and then here's the data grid text column that we have for the player quest name. And we've added this data grid text column cell style. This is how you bind a property, in this case the player quest tooltip contents, as a tooltip to a data grid cell. Now when the user hovers over this data grid, the name data grid, it's going to, to display a tooltip with the information we need, in this case the quest items to turn in and the rewards. And if we go down to the recipes data grid, we do the same type of thing here on lines 222 through 227, where we add the tooltip contents for the recipe. So let's run the program and see how it works. Now if I go north, I get a quest. If I go to the quest data grid and hover over the name, there's our tooltip. Defeat the snakes, the description, we've got the items needed to complete the quest, and the rewards. And if we go to the recipes data grid and hover over the granola bar, we've got the ingredients and what it creates. And that's all the changes that we're going to do in this lesson. As always, in the description below the video, I'll have a link to the support page with the source code. And if you have any questions, you can leave them there. Now for the future of the project, just to let you know where I've been for the last several months, I've started to work with a new client and our team maintains about 50 programs that have been written over the last 15 years or so. Plus we have a lot of new applications that we're developing. And we're developing applications in a lot of new, cool ways. We're doing REST APIs that are running in containers. We're doing neural network stuff, which is fun, but it takes up all my brain power and all my time keeping up with that and learning the things I need to learn for the new job. Plus I have a roughly two hour commute every day, at least until June when I might move a little bit closer. So I've had basically no time to work on this. But I think things have settled down a bit with the, with the client and the project work, so now I can get back into this. Although I am trying to find some ways to do this so that I can spend more time coding and less time on things like video editing and writing up the post and all that. A few things I'm considering are doing live coding for these lessons. I'll do it on Twitch and then save the videos on Twitch and on YouTube and then just post the code on the website so you can just copy paste that or get it out of GitHub. I've also started a Discord channel and I'll have a link to that in the description. That might be a little bit easier to do some of the support and maybe if people start using it, other people will be able to answer some of your questions there. And I'm also looking at how to integrate some of this into GitHub a little bit better so we have better test coverage so the builds are more automated, uh, just taking off some of the non-coding work that often comes along with writing a program. If you have any ideas or thoughts, please leave a comment either here on the video or on the support page on my website and let me know what you're thinking of. I'd like to continue this. I've got a lot of different ideas for it and I've got uh, a pretty cool architectural idea to make this more functional programming, kind of like F sharp or some of the other functional languages, OCaml. So now it's mostly a question of figuring out a way to continue working on this project without taking up too much of my free time. And like I say, if you have any suggestions, please let me know. Thanks.